Hello everyone and welcome back to CAR Entertainment. I'm your host Don Hamilton and today guys we're going to be moving on with our respiration section of A22 Biology guys and today previously haven't talked about ATP and aerobic runner respiration. We'll finish off with a bit of anaerobic respiration and then move on to photosynthesis. Yes, yes, I hear you boo and I know photosynthesis, photosynthesis but we have to get it done guys but in the meantime, we have to do a bit of anaerobic respiration, which is respiration without oxygen. So let's get into it. Right, well, anaerobic respiration in, in animals, they start with, as you see up the very top there, is a little bit of a diagram. Now, you start off with glycolysis, and glycolysis is exactly the same as it is in anaerobic respiration as it was in aerobic respiration. You get down to peruvic acid or peruviate, and this is converted into lactic acid, but this is done by lactate dehydrogenase and dehydrogenation. Okay, you have your NADH, which co is which converts to NAD in reducing, and it also goes vice versa. So we'll talk you through it. Anaerobic respiration in animals, and this is key. It's in animals as here. So it's most likely to occur in your skeletal muscles, as this is a consequence of strenuous exercise. So during strenuous exercise, muscles will will, will respire aerobically and anaerobically. They'll respire using both. Lactate or lactic acid will be produced by anaerobic respiration and it will accumulate in muscle which then causes your fatigue and cramp. This lactate is then removed whenever sufficient oxygen becomes available or if you stop exercising and then you let the oxygen come back and you start breathing. And so when sufficient oxygen becomes available, lactate is then oxidized back to peruviate which enters the lactic reaction or is converted into glycogen for storage. So whenever peruviate is converted into lactic acid, you see here where during that there in dehydrogenation, uh, you'll have NAD being converted to NADH, but the NAD will be reconvert or the NADH will be reconverted back to NAD when this lactate is oxidized back to peruviate. So you understand me. Whenever lactate dehydrogenase occurs in dehydrogenation of peruviate to lactate, then NADH is formed, but in the reverse when sufficient oxygen is available, then lactate is oxidized to peruviate and NAD is reformed. Okay, so whenever you convert lactate back to peruvate, this is called repaying back the oxygen debt. So now let's talk about anaerobic respiration in plants and fungi. There's the equation for that. Again, glycolysis is exactly the same down until you get peruvate, but this time you get ethanol and CO2, and CO2 goes out as a waste product. Okay, or sorry, CO2 comes in, obviously, in plants, uh, and then you produce ethanol for using this NADH. Uh, for using this NADH um, to get NAD and then vice versa, it's the same sort of principle. So let's just go for it. So the end product of anaerobic respiration is ethanol and CO2 as a waste product. So in anaerobic respiration, you have you will produce ethanol and CO2. That's what you'll produce after anaerobic respiration in plants. One of the differences is ethanol, unlike lactate, is not reconverted back to pyruvate but is eliminated as a waste product. So this ethanol is not coming back to Peruvia like lactate did. Ethanol goes out as a waste product. So when plants and fungi penetrate the soil, O2 levels are usually low in these environments. And therefore, you then need to respire anaerobically to allow ATP production to be maintained. And this lower metabolic rate in plants and fungi means that there will be a lower ATP yield from anaerobic respiration, which is not a significant an issue. So now we're going to move on to the respiratory quotient, um, which is the, the, the equation up there is the one you really need to learn. There's RQ, the number of moles of carbon dioxide and the number of moles of oxygen used up. Not the best equation, but uh, I like the way of thinking of it is the number of molecules of carbon dioxide and the number of molecules of oxygen used up. So RQ will is pr provide you information about the type of respiratory sub substrate which is used and then the type of respiration. So the different respiratory substrates we have are carbohydrate, lipids and protein and the RQ values for the stereotypical of carbohydrate is around 1, for lipids about 0 0.7 and for protein about 0 0.9. In humans the value of about 0 0.85 is normal as humans use a combination of both carbohydrates and lipids. 
So what else do your RQ values tell you? Well, RQ, well, if the RQ value is above 1, then it's likely that anaerobic respiration has taken place. And with enough anaerobic respiration, this will push the RQ value above 1. And the higher the value is above 1, then the higher proportion of anaerobic respiration that takes place. But do not forget, anaerobic respiration always takes place with aerobic respiration as well. So lock down the note 2 at the bottom. When the RQ value exceeds 1, uh, aerobic and anaerobic respiration are taking place. So... If a meal is rich in carbs, then the RQ value will approach 1, because obviously carbohydrates are starting to take about 1. But then after hours of eating, uh, sorry, after hours without eating, then this RQ value will drop, because lipids will then become used, uh, or sorry, will be used up, and variation are likely to occur, which means when you measure the plant RQ during the day, and also when measuring plant RQ during the day, photosynthesis involves gas exchange, which clouds the RQ value, so it may not be fully accurate because of photosynthesis being involved. So if the RQ value is more than one, it is usually for a plant or fungal tissue as well. Thank you for watching this video. I've been Dylan Hamilton from CA Entertainment and I'll see you next time.